Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. What an honor it is to be at Spring Ridge today. And it's, I'm just thankful to be with you. And the only reason I agreed to come and preach today is Brother Phillips was supposed to be gone. And I knew I could twist his arm to come preach for us if I came over here. So uh, last week I got to see a video of Brother Nate singing in JNT. And I told Brother Phillips, you can only come if you bring Nate with you and he comes to sing when you come. So uh, it is great to be here. Would you give your great pastor and his family a hand of appreciation? God is so good, isn't he? Amen. You can be seated just a moment. I got to visit a second. There's a couple people I don't know here. And so I want to want to say hello. And I'm, I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord. I do love to preach. There's two things that make me want to preach. Uh, it's good preaching bad preaching um, and you have a lot of good preaching around here but it's not just that I, I have trouble any of you ever have trouble just living for God in some of the areas you know what's right but it's hard not to when I hear brother BJ play the bass I get a little covetous and I hear all the talent you guys have and I, I'm uh, and your sister Phillips brother Phillips I appreciate their example not just here at church but uh, Brother Phillips and I, our friendship is, I don't know how you would describe it. We pick up, no matter how long it's been since we talked, if it's been months or weeks or days, we just pick right up where we were the last time. I called him this week, and he was between chapel services. He'd been to the elementary school, I believe, and was going to the high school. And I've seen where Sister Phillips does the same. I'm thankful for people that put the kingdom of God first. And the Phillips family put the kingdom first. They seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I believe God will take care of folks that do that. Amen. But it is such an honor to be here. And um, Brother Howard Stewart is a man in our church. He's battling Parkinson's now. And uh, it's, it's, it hurts to see an amen corner. He sits. We have three sections of pews. Uh, and he sits on the front row on this section over here. And he is just an amen corner. I mean, you can't preach it too hard. You can't preach too long. Uh, he is instrumental in us not having a clock on our back wall because uh, he would fuss about that if we ever seemed to be paying attention to it. You can't call too many prayer meetings. It's just that, it just you can't ask for a better saint of God. And Brother Howard is, is a preacher's friend. Uh, we were getting ready to go on a men's outing one day and he said brother Jimmy he said uh, you know I'm not one to give advice to a preacher and I, I knew that and I said yes sir he said but I think I've got some advice for you today and I said brother Howard I'm all ears because uh, that man just he loves truth he loves God and he said well there's two things a man ought to preach about every time he gets behind the pulpit I said, okay. He said, first off, every time you stand behind that sacred desk, you ought to preach about God. I said, well, I've got, yes, sir, I agree. What's number two? He said, well, second, you ought to preach about 20 minutes. <laughs> Brother Kraft used to tell us 20 minutes is long enough for a good preacher and way too long for a bad one. Uh -oh. And I heard him, but I considered a source. Now, the last, I say that because the last time I preached for Brother Phillips, I didn't realize how long it had been. But if I'm correct, the last time I preached for Brother Phillips was the launching service of Brother Bourne's church in Natchez. And Brother Phillips said, how about riding with me to Natchez this afternoon and uh, we'll go be in Brother Bourne's first service. I said, yeah, that sounds great. What time does the service start? He said, two. I said, well, that means we need to get on the road about 11.30 to get there in time. He said, that's right. And he turned the pulpit over to me about 11.15. We left at 11.30. I preached about 10 minutes. So I've got 10 minutes to go over today if I miss because the last time. Is that right? Amen. Praise God. It is good to be in the house. Well, one thing I love about your pastor is that he doesn't have an agenda other than fulfilling kingdom business. And he likes to talk. One guy went to a doctor and he said, Doc, look, I want you to give it to me straight. And I want you to tell me in plain English 
what's wrong with me? Don't give me this doctor speak. And uh, he said, sir, I, I think you'd rather doctor speak. He said, no, sir, I want it in plain English. He said, okay, well, in plain English, you, sir, are lazy. I said, well, that's what I asked for. He said, uh, I, I can take that. Now give me the medical term so I can tell my wife. I like Brother Phillips because he speaks in plain English, and I hope I have to speak in plain English today. I would love to preach a great revelation or, or something that, that tickles your ears and that uh, you thought, wow, I haven't seen it that way. But Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, and if I wanted to, I probably couldn't preach anything that you haven't heard before. But my message this morning, this afternoon, morning is as simple as it gets I say afternoon our church we have Sunday school at 2 and Pentecost live at 3 so I'm used to it being daylight yeah. and it's funny when we have somebody come and preach for us because they always say morning when it's daylight because they're used to morning service and if it's dark they say night and so we throw them off and so it throws me off I just said this afternoon because I'm used to preaching in the afternoon but I want to preach with the help of the Lord uh, for a few minutes from Revelation 4 and from Colossians 1. Revelation chapter 4 says, Thou art worthy, verse 11. Thank you very much. The Bible doesn't command us to stand in reverence to the word, but it, Jesus stood up for it to read, and we've made it a, a sign of our appreciating the word of God. There's nothing wrong with it. Revelation 4 and 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things turn to somebody and say you were created by God, you were created by God. he's God alone he didn't need our help to create and turn back to him and say and and say I saw a picture not long ago on Facebook it had a little pew that only had room for one person right. and it said when you don't feel like turning to your neighbor I don't see any of those here. Brother Phillips only one's got one like that. So uh, sorry about turning to your neighbor. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Colossians chapter 1. This is Paul writing to the church in Colossae in verse 16. He said, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for your sweet presence we feel in this house. We ask you to speak to us, God. We ask you to be anointed of you to deliver what you've laid on our heart. We give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I feel this message today. I feel it strongly. And I want God to be able to uh, use us. I don't feel like I'm an evangelist. Some folks absolutely love to preach out. Your pastor loves to preach out. He said he'd pay to preach. Uh, I would too. But I'm, I'm not as crazy about preaching out as some. I do want to do God's will. Uh, and I feel like uh, my abilities and giftings from God are, are less in the evangelistic category uh, than, in, than in administrative. But we've got to fulfill all God wants us to do. And it's amazing how... God uses you when you don't even realize he's using you. Uh, and I think Brother uh, Randall talked today, and Brother Phillips gave an illustration. He told me, I wasn't here to hear it, but of a friend, a mutual friend of ours from decades apart when we met him. But now when I met him, he told me he was an agnostic. Uh, and then we got to talking a little longer, and somehow Brother Phillips came up. He said, I, Scott Phillips? I know him. We used to debate each other when we were at work together. And I love that about Brother Phillips. He doesn't back down from what he believes. Uh, and he doesn't back down from what the Bible says. And if the Word shows something different than what we believe, then we're going to change our belief to line up with the Word of God. Amen. But I, I feel strongly that somebody needs to hear today 
that you were created by God. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. You need to understand that you are an original. Somebody looked at one guy one time and he was in, trying to encourage him. He said, always remember, you are unique, just like everybody else. But there's not another Noah. Brother Nate, you would frustrate yourself if you tried to be Noah. You, you're a great guy. You're very talented, but Noah's funnier than you are. <laughs> Sorry. Brother Nate, Brother Noah, don't try to be Nate. You're not alike. Now, they have a lot of genetics that are alike. They were, made, they were from the same parents. They have a lot of things that were just alike and they're growing up, but God made every single one of us different. But he also... Don't make any junk. And God made you. And you have a purpose that no one else can fulfill. Uh, John, 1 John 2 and 2, said he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Anybody glad that all my sins are forgiven? That all my hope is in Jesus. He was, he's willing to take, I love Psalm 103. It says that God doesn't reward us according to our iniquity and he won't keep his anger forever and he will not always chide. And, and he, he does so amazing things in our life when we give it to him. But this verse here tells me that he's paid for more than I've experienced. He didn't give Spring Ridge Pentecostal Church the ability to inhabit this beautiful building and not desire for it to be absolutely full. I think you ought to have so many here that you ought to have two main services on Sunday just to get them all in here. I believe that's God's will. And I get that because his word says that he is the propitiation or the payment and substitute for our sins, but not just for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Psalm 139, 14, this is hard for some people. You ought to be able to read this verse while looking in the mirror and talking to God and say, I will praise thee for I, somebody say I. I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's hard for some people to look in the mirror and say, man, I like you. But you need to be able to. And he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, recognizing that God made me. And if that's not enough, he looks again and says, wow. Marvelous are thy works. Some of you won't even make eye contact with me right now because it just makes you nervous to think about bragging on yourself. You're not bragging when you recognize that God made you and God didn't make any junk. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. God, when I look at me and what you have made, I think, wow, that's awesome. Now, brother, we might be fat, we might be bald-headed. And you know what's good about being fat and bald-headed? I got to tell you this because I heard it this morning. You know what's good about it, Ruby? Nothing. But you know what else? What's good about it? Jesus loves fat, bald-headed people. I heard that this morning. Anybody guess who told me that joke? You've heard it once or twice, so you know the source. It doesn't matter what my negatives are. God made me. And he don't make junk. God made you. And he, you were made by him. And, all caps, for him. He didn't make you just so you could stand in front of the mirror and say, wow, God, you did a good job when you made me. He said all things were made by and for his pleasure. God's desire is that when he looks down and sees me, he says, boy, I'm glad I made him. Boy, I'm glad I made her. Look what she's doing for my kingdom. First Corinthians, Paul said, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
I'm reading several scriptures here, but I want somebody to catch what I'm saying in the next few moments and say, wait a minute. I've been existing. There are some good things about my life. There are some bad things I wish I could forget. If I had a chance, I'd go back and redo. But I'm not my own. Now, if you're here today and you haven't been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, God wants that for you today. Because you were created by him and for him and he wants to dwell in what he's created and get glory out of it. First Samuel chapter 17, if I were preaching a youth rally, you would expect me to go to this passage. I think this text is preached more at youth rallies than anywhere else. But David, anybody know who David was in the Bible? David uh, is minding his own business. He's got the lowest job in the family. Anybody ever had the lowest job in the family? Only me. I, I have. When I was 10 years old, we were incredibly blessed. All my friends and cousins had, had three-wheelers and different things, and, and we wanted one so badly, and we'd ask our parents, and they would tell us no. They were too dangerous. But in, in 83 or so, they started making four-wheelers. They started getting popular. 84 came along, and my friends got them. 85 came along, and, and my friends had four-wheelers, and I'd never had one. But my parents, my dad did something just, you're talking about making a guy anxious. We got in the truck. We had a three-quarter ton single cab Chevrolet pickup that ran on gas or propane. How many ever had a truck that ran on propane before? Brother Hayes raised his hand. It did. It had, it had a gas tank, and it also had propane it would run on. We loaded up the four of us in that single cab truck, and he drove, and he said, I'll tell you what, guys. It was almost Christmas time. He said, if y'all see a Honda shop today will buy a four-wheeler. It's a long ways from Polkville to North State Street where the old Honda shop used to be. And I, I was 10. I didn't know where Honda shops were, but I was looking. And, and Mom didn't help. She'd say, are you looking? Are you looking? Do you see one? And he drove us all around Jackson. We didn't see a Honda shop. We passed the Yamaha place. Well, back then, that was the same place. We passed another place. We was like, come on, we've got to find one. We, he had our hopes so high. And finally, we saw a Honda shop. And we stopped, and he bought us for Christmas a 1985. Now, that same Christmas, I had three friends that got 1986 Honda four tracks. They drove to Memphis because you didn't have to pay sales tax in Memphis. And they saved some money. But we bought a 1985 because if you bought a 1985, still brand new, it was cheap enough to make up for the sales tax and we didn't have to drive all the way to Memphis. That was my dad's reasoning. But we got that four-wheeler, and, man, it was awesome. And we had rules. We couldn't drive it over second gear in the yard. We were young and little and couldn't go fast. Uh, but we hadn't had that four-wheeler very long, and we tore the starter up. Dad says it was because we'd crank it and drive from here to the front pew and kill it, then crank it and drive to Brother BJ and kill it, and crank it and drive over to Brother Hayes and kill it. And we tore that starter up, and in 1986, it was $200 to replace the starter on a four-wheeler. That was a lot of money. Furthermore, Dad said that me and my brother had to pay for it. Now, how does a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old come up with $400, $200, dollars each? He said, I've got good news. I'm going to let you work for it. If you will do this entire list of chores, which included vacuuming the house every day, it included cleaning up after every meal. We were homeschooled. Uh, cleaning up after every meal, loading the dishwasher. And we had a, a lot of extra chores. We had to vacuum and wash the vehicles inside and out. And, and just the whole list in addition to our regular chores. And if you'll do all of this, uh, I will pay you $10 a week. I can. I'm pretty, I can come close to it. But I got $10 a week. And he said, the good news is if you'll do that for 11 weeks, you can pay your $100. I said, wait a minute, Dad. $10 a week. I ought to be able to do it in 10 weeks. He said, oh, no. You got to pay your tithes. So I had to, for 11 weeks, do that whole list of chores. And, and then my brother had to do the list of chores for 11 weeks, and we bought a starter for that four-wheeler. And do you know we had that four-wheeler for another six or seven years, and the starter never tore up again. 
when I finally got big enough to kickstart that thing, I would kickstart it just to keep from risking tearing the starter up. But when you have paid for something, it means a little more to you. And when you've got an investment in there, do you know God's got an investment inside of you? And he's given you grace, he's given you mercy, he's given you love, he's given you peace, he's given you joy. And he didn't do that just so that you could have it and enjoy it. But he said, I want something back from you that gives me pleasure. So David's doing the, the lowest job and his dad comes one day and said, David, I want you to take this corn, I want you to take these bread and I want you to go check on your brethren and carry these cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how they are and, and take their pledge. And Saul, they were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now David was excited, but where he was headed, they weren't so excited. They were scared. And Saul and all, the, they were there fighting and David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded. He came to the trench just as they were going to the battle to fight. And he gets excited. The Bible says he shouted for the battle because they had put the battle in array, army against army. And verse 22, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read stuff like this, I picture it, and I'm imagining this young guy that's so excited. When they went off to battle, he wished that he was old enough to go off into battle. But he still had this job to do that was the lowest of the low. Being a shepherd, was the, nobody wanted to do that job. But David didn't just do his job. He did more than his job. But he, he got there, and he talked with them, and they, here comes uh Goliath, out of the armies of the Philistines, he spake according to the same words, and David heard them. I skipped some. The men of Israel, when they saw the men, they fled, and they were afraid. And they said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, I want you to read into this. They're telling how bad it is, but they have faith that God is going to deliver them. They just don't have faith enough to believe it's going to be through them. And they said, the man who killeth him, the king is going to give him tons of money. And he's going to give him his daughter. And his family's never going to be in bondage. And verse 26, I wish you could see it in my notes. And David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what? I've got what in about size 30 font and all bold. What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? The same news that everybody else heard, he heard it differently. They said, have you seen how big this problem is and how terrible this problem is? It's so big that if somebody can take care of this problem, they're going to be made rich. And David said, what? Now, I'm thankful that my timing was amazing. I got here just as they were going to battle, and I ran out to sea. But I'm even better than I thought it was. I am here, and they've got this amazing package put together for the guy that brings it. And nobody's done it yet. He said, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away for the reproach? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You know, I see this problem that you're telling me about. But I also see God. And all my hope is in Jesus. And I remember when I faced another problem that looked large. And I didn't have anybody else to turn to. I wasn't waiting on somebody else to run the aisle or get out of their pew. And I was like, oh God, here's a lion. What am I going to do? I need you, Jesus. And Jesus was all I needed. And I took care of the lion. There was another time when a bear came along. And I couldn't do it by myself. But I was made by him and for him. And my current job was to take care of these sheep. 
and the problem looked like I wasn't going to be able to do my job. But I remembered. I was made by him and for him. It's not me that's going to get the reward for these sheep being kept. It's ultimately him. And I need to do my job. I need him to help me do my job. And so all the people said, verse 27, so we'll tell you again. I'm telling you, the man that kills him is going to get great riches. His family is going to be free. And he's going to get to marry the king's daughter. And David is still thinking, wow, this is awesome. And his brother comes up and says, why did you even come down here? Everybody's getting excited because you're showing up and you're acting all excited. But I'm going to remind you who you are. Your job is to take care of those few sheep. Speaking of those few sheep, who's watching them if you're here? I know you're just wanting to show off. You're just wanting to come see what's going on. Why are you even here? And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? I wasn't asking for this battle, but I show up and you're not doing it. And God, I believe, wants it done. And what he needs is somebody who believes they were made by him and for him. I just happen to fit that bill. And so he turned towards somebody else. He gets through with Eliab getting on to it and he turns look at verse 30 he turns from him toward another and spake after the same manner did did I hear right what did they say would happen to the guy that kills this guy and they answered him you heard right he's going to be rich his family's going to be free he gets to marry the king's daughter and he said well oh You take me to King Saul. This don't look right. All these warriors scared to death and this little bitty guy. And so they took him. They told Saul what he had said. And Saul sent for him. I love verse 32. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. King, don't worry. I got this. I know you got all them guys out there scared, but I am here now. You got to recognize David is not even a warrior. He's a teenager. And he's trying to comfort the king of all Israel, the commander in chief. He's saying, I got this. Don't worry about it. You see, King Saul, you can rest easy. I'm here and all your problems are about to go away. It sounds crazy, but you know what? The God that was God of David is the God of, insert your name here. And I don't know what jobs all need to be done. I could look around and name a few, and I'm not pastor here. But I could say, you know what, I know there's got to be a need for this and a need for this. And Spring Ridge Pentecostal Church is incredibly blessed with talent, with ability, with exactly the skill sets needed to accomplish everything God wants this church to accomplish. And if you don't already have it in here, then he's got you here to win the person that can do that. And David had been whatever he was given. He didn't just do that job. Too many of us, we wait and say, well, if they really want me to do this, they'll ask me to do this three times. And when I say no, they'll keep insisting. Then I'll know it's God's will. You know, we, it's, God's will can be a funny thing. One guy was telling me, he said, I drove down County Line Road. And the hot now sign was on at Krispy Kreme. And I said, God, if it's your will for me to stop and get a dozen donuts, then let there be a parking space open right in front of the door. He said, and would you believe it? On my 11th time around the building, there was a parking space right there. Sometimes that's the way we are about God's will, but when David was being obedient and serving God to the best of his ability in whatever job, when his dad said, okay, David, I want you to go check on your brothers. David didn't say, okay, 
Well, if you'll find somebody to take my place for a Sunday school class next Sunday, I'll go. David went and found somebody to take his place and said, I want you to, to handle this. And when he got to the battle and he got so excited, he didn't just abandon his carriage with all the stuff in it. He left the carriage in the hands of a keeper and said, I want this to be done, but I'm made by him and for him, and I believe I'm made for more than what I'm currently doing. And he got so excited, he ran and shouted for the battle. There's something exciting when you know something great's going to happen. When Brother Phillips asked what we were doing on Thursday, I looked at my calendar, and I've got something every single day this week except Thursday that's important on my calendar. I thought, I want to come. Now, I've never heard Brother Colton Carroll preach either, but I know his dad. I know he comes from great stock, and I've heard some great reports, and so it's easy to get excited about something. We went last year and some of you guys got to go with us and we went to North American Youth Congress. There was no doubt in our mind that God was going to do amazing things at North American Youth Congress. There was no doubt in our mind that we were going to see people filled with the Holy Ghost, that God was going to do miracles and wonders and signs because when you get that many people there, God's going to do something. Have you ever been in a prayer room before a service and the power's already there and you think, boy, I can't wait for church today. There's no telling what's going to happen. And that excitement, that's why David felt. I'm going to go in January. I've got a grandbaby coming and boy, I'm excited about that. I'm more excited than her parents are about that baby coming. They're excited. But then she's supposed to be born and I was so excited last week for the doctor to say she's going to be born on or before January 18th. And I got real excited about that because the next week is because of the times that's made for ministers and pastors to be there. And you know what? I love that conference. Not because of where it's at or who's speaking or any of that. But you cannot get that many people at the start of a year longing for God's will in their life and in the church they serve there hungry and God not respond. I've never been there and God not speak to me or challenge me or do that. And because I recognize, God, you love your church. And even if I don't deserve for your church to grow, you want your church to grow. And if I position myself to be used of you, there's no limit to what you are going to do. Because I am made by him and for him. I want somebody to get that. I'm, I'm almost ready to close today. You know, John Maxwell said, other people can stop you temporarily, but only you can stop you permanently. I don't want to just recognize that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but I want to recognize just as strongly that I'm made for him. And so I want to ask myself, what am I doing with what he's blessed me with for him? So I'm going to pull out an old, old, old illustration. Guys, you have those? We give one to everybody? I gave Nate and Noah, or gave their pastor, a box of paper clips. And I want everybody here to take a paper clip, whether you're two or 102 or anywhere in between. Skinny and good looking, fat and bald headed, it doesn't matter. I want you to take a paper clip. Anybody ever heard of Lloyd's of London? Nope, that shows how old I am. So I see some nodding. Lloyd's of London is an insurance company that are known to be the masters of assessing risk. And they insure crazy things. Like Brother Nate, they may get his voice insured. And they would decide how much Brother Nate's voice is worth. And they would assess the risk. But it's a large company. And uh, they were looking, as any wise company would do, were looking for waste in their company and they wanted to tighten the strings and make sure that things were, were operating as efficiently as they could. And the CEO noticed that they used an astronomical amount of paper clips. And he said, now this may seem small to some people, but he hired a company to track the use of 100,000 paper clips in their company. And so they gave out 100,000 paper clips and they tracked how they were used. And this is interesting. 14,000, I'd like one, Brother Noah. 14,163 
of these paper clips were used, were bent or twisted during phone conversations. Anybody ever done that? I've done that. So they're, you know, bent or twisted during a phone conversation. 7,200 were used to clip garments together, like holding your tie or fixing something. Or I've used the paper clip before as a collar stay. You may have ever done that? They will work. 7,200 were used. Here's the largest category, 19,143 of 100,000 paper clips were used for various games employees played. Now, I'd be in that category with some of mine. 5,434 were used as toothpicks and ear scratchers. Hopefully in that order. 5,308 were used for fingernail cleaners. 3,916 were used for cleaning of some sort. And they work good for that. You can clean your keyboard and different things. Uh, now this is actually the largest category. 24,550 of 100,000 paper clips were either lost in the shuffle, fell to the floor, discarded, swept up, or vacuumed into oblivion. And then, there was one last category. 20,286, one-fifth of the 100,000 paper clips were used to clip papers together. Now, I didn't come to preach about paper clips this morning, but I'm preaching to people that were created by him and for him and for a purpose, and they were put in places to do jobs that no one else could do. I wonder what we could would find if we could see the results of everybody in this building and what all we're being used for. You see, the problem with paper clips is they can easily be used effectively for things they weren't designed to do. They really do make good head scratchers. They really do do a great job of cleaning the gunk and gook out from under fingernails. They really do work for things for which they were not necessarily created. And they're, they're things that may benefit, but they have no eternal value. Colossians 3 and 2 says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. God didn't put us here just to do earthly things. You may be a great plumber. You may be an amazing accountant. You may be awesome at typing and be a great secretary. You may be a wonderful woodworker. I, I get a little jealous every time I walk in this building. Brother Randall had an amazing job of taking wood and doing unreal things. We have two cabinets in our family life center that he built, and we use them, and people come in and brag on them, and I think, wow, what an awesome job was done here. And that, that here, it was done for God's glory and done for God's work. Um, but another problem with paper clips is they were viewed as cheap and they wouldn't be missed if they weren't used correctly. 24,000 of them were either lost, discarded. If they fell down, it wasn't worth being able to be picked up. But you know what? The people that lost them or threw them away may have thought that. But the owner that paid a good price for them thought he'd like to see them used for what they were created for. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you which you have of God, and you are not your own? You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. And number three, they were easily knocked to the floor or discarded. It didn't seem worth the effort to pick them up when they had fallen. That same guy that I preached to you about, and I'm closing if music wants to come. David. He defeated Goliath. He accomplished a lot of things for the kingdom of God. He also was used for things other than the purpose for which God created him and tried to work it out his own way, and he messed up. 
he messed up greater than any of you. I don't think we have any murderers here, but if we do, God still said, that's the man after my own heart. He committed adultery. He did terrible, terrible things, which would make him say, I can never be used for the glory of God. But there was something inside of him that said, no, I'm created by him and for him. And when Nathan the prophet stand before me and I was trying to just go about mine, he painted a picture. He didn't tell me what I had done. He painted a picture of somebody else doing something. And it made me so mad, I wanted to take the guy's life. And he said, thou art the man, David. David didn't crawl under the pew and think I'll never be anything for God. That's condemnation. That's never God. But conviction says, David, you did this but you're still created by him and for him. And you were created for his pleasure. Now, there are going to be some consequences. You're going to lose this baby. There's going to be some terrible things that are going to happen because of it. But you were created by him and for him. And David responded. And we read Psalm 51, which is a beautiful psalm of repentance because he recognized, even though I've blown it, even though I've messed up in such a great way, I was created by him and for him. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house right now. I don't know a lot of you. And I don't know your story. I don't know the mistakes. I don't know the great things you've accomplished. But I'll tell you what, you were made by him and for him. And in 2018, what's left of it, and in 2019 and 2020, should the Lord Terry is coming and beyond, God wants to get pleasure from his creation of you. So if you're here today and you're not absolutely full of the Holy Ghost and you can't sing with assurance that all my hope is in Jesus. All my sins are forgiven. I, I'm, I'm going to take a trip one day. I'm not going to be late. I'm going to be ready. You're in a great place to get ready this morning and God will fill you. If you have been used of God but you're not being used of God now like you have been in the past or like you know he's calling for you to be. I'm opening this altar right now. I don't care where you are. You are made for more. I don't care what you've accomplished. You were made to do more for the kingdom of God. You haven't gotten too old to be in the battle, to be in the fight. You see, later in David's life, when he had accomplished so many battles, nobody had killed giants before David did. But you read, after he did that incredible job, there were many giant killers. And finally, a day came when David was in the success stage of his life. And he thought, well, this time when they go out to battle, I can just stay back. I don't have to give as much effort as I used to. That's when he fell. Because the devil has perfect timing. He knows exactly when you're at your weakest and what it's going to take to tempt you. And that's what he's going to come at you with. But if that's where you are or found yourself recently, you need to say, you know what? I'm made by him and for him. And on this November Sunday morning, it may be rainy outside, but the Holy Ghost is going to rain on the inside and I'm going to be able to do what God wants me to do. Would you join me around this altar right now and give yourself all over again to God and recognize God I made by you and for you. If you want hope today, God will restore hope. If you haven't had the peace that you've longed for, you lay your head on your pillow and you just worry about what have I got myself into. God wants to restore all of that today. He wants this church to be full. He wants every Sunday school class to be full. He wants every service to be impactful and lives to be changed and this baptistry to be used regular. He wants this altar to be a place where new life is found on a continual basis. Would you talk to him right now? God, we come to you. God, our heart is ready, God, to be used by you. I want to be used for the purpose for which I was created, God. I want to fulfill your will in my life and in my family's life. Hallelujah. You and I were made to worship. You and I are called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. Oh, you and I embrace surrender. You and I choose to believe. You and I. Love. You and I 
Forgiven and free. Oh, you and I embrace surrender. You and I choose to believe. You and I will see. We were meant to be. You and I are made to worship. You and I are called to love. You and I are forgiven. just uh, amen just raise our hands close our eyes can we just wait on the Holy Ghost for a moment Lord we love you today hallelujah Jesus we thank you for your word that you have given us today 